This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. When we look at the world around us, our minds are trained to fill in visual gaps to form a more complete mental picture. So if you see a peak of a mountain in the distance, chances are pretty good there's like a whole mountain below it. Yeah, and for the most part, that kind of mental extrapolation is really useful. When we notice part of a thing out in the world, our brains automatically help us see the bigger picture. That's 99PI's own, Kurt Colstead. Um, and so before we launch the, the bigger episode for today, Kurt and I recently encountered a small story that dovetails with something that we've covered before. It's about how our imaginations, while trying to fill in those gaps, sometimes lead us astray. They do. And, you know, even with things that we think we visualize really well, like, for example, icebergs. Mm-hmm. Anywhere you look, from like an inspirational poster to a kid's illustration, we think we know what icebergs look like. They, you know, look like this uh, little rounded hump on top and this sort of spike going into the water below, sort of like a big ice cream cone. Right. I've definitely seen that before. I mean, that's the whole expression, tip of the iceberg. You see that little mound and you see that <laughs> deep spike. And that's the whole point of the visual metaphor and the metaphor metaphor. <laughs> and I've thought about that before and I've used it a lot myself, but I never really considered it literally like... As in just seeing the tips of icebergs and what that really means until I saw this image posted online by a glaciologist. Here, uh, just take a look. Okay, so this is an iceberg, I'm assuming. It's kind of a watercolor drawing. It's pretty simple. But it's basically just like a lump of ice. It's uh, a bit smoother than, you know, the the icebergs that we are picturing in our heads before. Mm -hmm. It's more like a, a stone in a river. And like we've been told about icebergs in school, uh, most of it sits below the surface of the water. But it really doesn't look like that big cone with that deep vertical root. It really is like a, like a scoop of ice cream uh, rather than a cone. Exactly. And, and it's, you know, part of that is what you'd expect, right? You expect only a small part of it to show up above the water. But the rest of it, what you see below, it's nothing like that cone shape, right? And the woman who drew it, her name is Megan Thompson Munson, and she's a glaciologist. And she posted this watercolor online with a really specific call to action. Basically, she argues that we need to rethink how we represent icebergs. Hmm. I mean, I think I can see the problem just in her drawing itself. We're taught that 10% is above the water. And this shows, you know, basically 10% is above the water. But it doesn't have that uh, deep vertical configuration. Because when you think about it, that doesn't make any sense. If you put like a pool noodle yeah. in, a, in a pool, it wouldn't stand upright. It goes on its side. Exactly. And, and that's her point, right? It's like, you know, once you think about it, you kind of get it. But you have to think about it first. So in <laughs> light of this misconception, she's urging other scientists to think about it and to draw icebergs in, quote, stable orientations. So this is just one example, and all icebergs are presumably different. How do you know what the orientation should be, what you should be picturing? Well, that's the thing. Uh, once she put this image up online, right, this software developer came into the thread, and his name is Joshua Tauber, and he was basically inspired by her post to make this website called Icebreaker. <laughs> and it's really simple. It just lets you draw ice shapes and see how they float. So, for example, if you draw a cone it'll slowly reorient that cone to float on its side. And you can sort of see that shift in slow motion too. So you can kind of see the physics in action. And in the end, it winds up in this stable orientation. Huh. That's so cool. Yeah. This is like, you show me a picture of a cone and now it's definitely a cone that's like sadly on its side. Um, (laughs) So the idea with Iceberger is you just trace out any shape and then it'll just rotate till it finds its level. And that's how it would would behave in nature. Exactly it. That's exactly it. And the site has some disclaimers like, you know, real icebergs are three-dimensionally complex. Their <laughs> densities are going to be a little different. So right. so the website is just sort of a simple intuition aid, more than a scientific tool. And the main point is just to give you a better idea of what might happen, roughly speaking, to various shapes, like this one. <laughs> well, this is a cat. This is a drawing of a cat. It is a um, cat. And so uh, this is like what if there was a cat-shaped iceberg. And when you see it, it's actually surprisingly a uh, stable configuration of the cat's head above the water and the tail above the water, but it, it is pretty funny. Yeah, it is. And, you know, odds are maybe some part of this would break off, like the tail in real life, right. who knows. But, but it does give you an idea that, like, okay, what you see above the surface and what you can imagine underwater can be very different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just kind of funny. But so, so other than, you know, getting 
an accurate scientific picture to sort of combat this proverbial vision of what we have of, of icebergs. Why is it important to visualize icebergs properly? Like, why was this uh, M- Megan's hill to die on? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was it was her glacier to die on, in part because she's a glaciologist, right? Right. Um, and practically speaking, okay, I, there's not a whole lot of application for this, right? It, like, if you're boating close to an iceberg, it is good to know that an iceberg could spread out a ways under the water. Um, that way, you know, you might avoid hitting it. But really, it speaks to this larger issue um, in many scientists, like geology, where so much of the world is invisible to us, right? So my dad, for example, is a geophysicist. And when he's explaining big planetary physical phenomena and change over time, like how tectonic plates shift around the world, visual aids are completely essential. So the bigger issue is is representing things more scientifically in general, uh, whether it be icebergs in, in pop culture or scientific diagrams in textbooks or, or scientific diagrams on the news or something like that. Right. It's like as long as we're going to try to represent these things, we might as well get it right, you know, for the sake of education and for the sake of really understanding the world around us. For sure. And what this fairly specific and smaller story made me think of was Emmett's 99 PI episode on dinosaurs. It's about how, you know, drawings have both been shaped by, but have also shaped the discipline of paleontology. And, you know, like glaciologists or geologists, paleontologists have this important role in helping us visualize things. But like these other scientists, they have to extrapolate at times, too, based on whatever evidence they have. So evidence like the fossilized bones of, of dinosaurs or or even the sort of modern genetic relatives of dinosaurs. That, that's how we extrapolate what they look like. Yeah, exactly. And so icebergs are kind of this great contemporary physical example, but they're also this useful analogy, right? It's really easy to use icebergs to explain how we sometimes can't see what's below the surface. And they hint at this larger challenge that scientists face more broadly. Like, how do we picture what we can't see? And it turns out that's a much deeper question. On that note, we're going to revisit Emmett Fitzgerald's story called Welcome to Jurassic Art. And while listening, you might want to keep other scientific disciplines in mind because it probably applies to most of them. Anyone who has had kids knows that they go through obsessive phases that can last anywhere from a few days to several years. I went through a lot of phases growing up. That's producer Emmett Fitzgerald. There was a brief train phase. Then in preschool, I was obsessed with farming equipment. I could list obscure European tractor brands off the top of my head like an old Italian wheat farmer. But I think my most intense obsession, like many kids, was dinosaurs. I knew more about dinosaurs at the age of five than I do now, and I was all but certain that I would one day become a paleontologist. I don't know exactly where this dinosaur obsession came from, but I think part of it was just that dinosaurs looked so cool. I had all these books filled with incredible drawings of colorful dinosaurs leaping around, roaring, and tearing into one another. I fell in love with the artwork in those books. And at least for the time being, art is the only way we experience dinosaurs. We can study bones and fossils, but barring the invention of time travel or some Jurassic Park resurrection scenario, we will never see these animals with our own eyes. There are no photos or video, which means that if we want to picture how they look, someone has to draw them. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Bucker, known to the folks in North Texas as Jurassic Bob. Uh, I dig bones, dinosaur bones. Bob Bakker is one of the most famous living paleontologists, and he also happens to be a very skilled paleo artist. He thinks the two go hand in hand. Art is very important in teaching natural history science, maybe all science. Teach everyone art, and everyone music, too. Patterns. Jeez. I like Bob a lot. When I interviewed him in a studio in Boulder, Colorado, he showed up an hour early, and he brought his own snacks. Uh, he's got snacks here. He's got coffee and some apple pie. Free-range apple pie. This is so liberal, this place. This is so uh, bolder. Cage-free apple pie. Once we got started with our interview, Bob said that, like me, he got obsessed with dinosaurs and dinosaur art pretty early on. How I got uh, hooked was a piece of journalism 
from 1953 Life magazine cover story called The World We Live In, and had pictures of dinosaurs and whatnot. The cover image was the head of a long-necked dinosaur sitting in a swamp, munching on grass, with a stegosaurus in the background sort of staring off into space. And inside was this long article about evolution. After two hours with that Life magazine, I announced to my startled parents, Mom and Dad, I want to grow up and be a vertebrate paleontologist. And Dad had no expression, and Mom smiled and said, That's nice, dear. It's a stage you'll outgrow. But unlike me, dinosaurs weren't just a childhood phase for Jurassic Bob. By the time he headed off to college, a career in vertebrate paleontology was still the game plan. But it was kind of a strange time to be entering the field. In the mid-20th century, American dinosaur science was in a bit of a rut. Dinosaurs were considered big, dumb, cold-blooded reptiles. Evolutionary failures destined for extinction. And that view of dinosaurs affected how they were painted and drawn. Most of the paintings of dinosaurs, they're not moving. They're not interacting with each other. There's no spark of uh, intelligent social life. And their bodies were like hulking masses of flesh. The way Brontosaurus and Diplodocus, the biggest dinosaurs, were illustrated, they were like giant gray vacuum cleaners with very, very short legs. And they were slowly pulling themselves across the landscape or sitting neck deep in a fetid swamp Dinosaurs were often drawn sitting in swamps, like on that Life magazine cover. The thinking was they were so large they couldn't possibly hold up their own body weight. And if they were drawn on land, they usually dragged their fat tails behind them as they walked. And that's where we were in the early 1960s. Dinosaurs were sad, cold-blooded dead ends in the history of life. But paleontology was about to go through... A spectacular and unanticipated U-turn. And a young Bob Bakker, just off to college, would find himself right in the thick of the action. Freshman year, the Yale Geology Department took me, a bunch of other freshmen, out to dig. The trip out west was led by one of Bob's professors at Yale, a paleontologist named John Ostrom. And among other things, we dug up four raptors. They were a new species of raptor that Professor Ostrom named Deinonychus. Meaning terrible claw. And the bones were found really close together. Presumably they lived together? They were a pack? Maybe intelligent? But what really got Professor Ostrom excited was the anatomy of the skeleton. After studying the fossil remains back at Yale, Ostrom concluded that Deinonychus had not been a slow, plodding swamp creature. It had been fleet-footed, agile, and extremely active. Ostrom began to argue that if you really looked at the anatomy of many dinosaurs, they looked less like lumbering lizards and more like super athletic birds. And his student, Bob Bakker, found this idea really compelling. He remembers looking at a skeleton of a different dinosaur called Ornithelestes. It really did look like a roadrunner with a long bony tail and teeth, but wow, it just spoke agility. But then you read the textbooks and you're not supposed to believe that. As an undergraduate, Bakker dissected modern animals in an effort to better understand dinosaur musculature. And he concluded that the old stereotypes about stupid, sluggish dinosaurs just didn't hold up. They weren't slow and sloppy. Now, this idea wasn't totally new. Bakker says that for decades, going back as early as the mid-19th century, there had been people saying that dinosaurs were smart, active, and bird-like. But... These facts were forgotten about, really. They dropped out of textbooks. So Bakker decided to publish a paper in a Yale journal, and his editor says, I know what you should call this study. And I said, what? She said, you should call it the superiority of dinosaurs. I said, yeah, that's it. They weren't uh, evolutionary has-beens. They weren't dead ends in the flow of Darwinian process. They were top of the line. They beat everybody. But convincing people that dinosaurs were actually totally different than they had been depicted for the past 60 years was going to require more than a few good academic papers. To really change people's minds, sometimes you got to show instead of tell. 
And remember, Bakker was a skilled illustrator as well as a scientist. And so when John Ostrom wrote his definitive paper on Deinonychus, he asked Bakker to do the illustration. And I positioned the bones as if his raptor was running. In the picture, the raptor is nearly parallel with the ground, its left leg springing forward, its right leg curled tightly against its torso, preparing for the next stride. The tail is high in the air. It's beautiful and kind of terrifying. Ostrom put the picture right on the front of his paper, and it quickly became an iconic drawing. No one had ever seen anything quite like it. Baca is like a renegade. This is Darren Nash, a paleontologist based in the UK. He's got like a flamboyant appearance. He insists on wearing a cowboy hat all the time. He's got a giant bushy beard. And right from the late 60s, when he's, you know, starting to talk about this stuff, he's, he's drawing these agile, active dinosaurs. Bakker finished up at Yale and went off to graduate school, where he continued to speak truth to the slow, dumb dinosaur establishment. He wrote academic and popular articles about how impressive dinosaurs had been. And he illustrated them all himself. He drew dinosaurs bounding across the prehistoric landscape like track and field stars with lithe, muscular bodies. So prior, prior to this time, an animal like Tyrannosaurus would have been drawn as like a Godzilla-type animal dragging its tail on the ground. It's not a particularly attractive beast. But under Bakker, you've got this thing shown with massive, bulging muscles. And Bakker's athletic dinosaurs became a model for other paleo artists. So when my Deinonychus drawing appeared, some y- artist younger than I said, huh, okay, now we can do it. Artists like Gregory Paul embraced this new, exciting vision of dinosaurs. They started giving their dinosaurs vibrant colors and occasionally feathers to really emphasize their birdness. Soon, images of athletic, colorful dinosaurs were everywhere. And they helped fuel the revolution that was taking place in paleontology. Throughout the 70s, more and more paleontologists got on board with Ostrom and Bakker's theories. They found new fossils and footprint evidence suggesting that dinosaurs had been warm-blooded, intelligent, and bird-like. This period has become known as the dinosaur renaissance, a moment when we totally rethought all of our assumptions about these incredible prehistoric animals. And Darren Nash thinks art was a huge part of its success. I think that part of the the reason that the dinosaurs of the dinosaur renaissance, the dinosaurs of Ostrom and, and Bakker, drew in so many scientists in the 60s and 70s was because it was accompanied by brilliant visuals. If anyone missed out on this scientific revolution and still thought that dinosaurs were slow and stupid, that ended in 1993. The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park are very active. The dinosaurs of Jurassic Park, 1993, they are the dinosaur renaissance. Dinosaurs. And when that movie came out, the whole world got to see these fierce, athletic creatures running through kitchens and eating lawyers off of toilets. And once you've seen the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, you can't unsee them. I think it cemented the notion of athletic dinosaurs. This is John Conway. He draws dinosaurs for a living. I'm a paleo artist, which means that I draw and paint prehistoric animals. Conway got interested in paleo art after reading Bob Bakker's book, The Dinosaur Heresies. And in the early part of his career, he drew dinosaurs that looked a lot like Bakker's, super lean and muscly. But after a while, he started to feel kind of funny about it. He says that all of his dinosaurs looked like they had been shrink-wrapped. You know those suction pack, you pack your clothes and you put the uh, the vacuum cleaner on it and you suck all the air out and it shrinks it down. And that's sort of what we were doing with dinosaurs. We were sort of <laughs> putting skin on them and then vacuuming out anything that was in between that skin and the muscles. Now, paleo artists weren't just doing that to make their dinosaurs look all cool and buff. They were trying to be accurate. I am part of the generation of paleo artists that grew up from a young age when we first started to think that it really mattered to get things right. And to get things right, you want your art to be rooted in real scientific evidence. And the main piece of evidence was often a skeleton. Paleo artists would base the shape of their dinosaurs on an accurate skeleton. 
The bones give you a pretty good idea where the muscles should go, but soft tissues like skin and cartilage and fat are much harder. Fat usually doesn't survive for millions of years in fossils. And so without any evidence of it, paleo artists tended to be pretty conservative about how much fat they gave their dinosaurs. Which makes total sense. You're not going to add something that you don't have evidence for. But the result was that all these dinosaurs looked like they went to the gym three times a day and drank protein shakes for every meal. John Conway says it began to feel as though paleo artists had replaced one orthodoxy with another. At some point, I thought, you know, we can't just keep doing this. This is not interesting in many ways. And is it even right? Is this conservative approach really giving people the right notion about what dinosaurs looked like? Just because fat didn't survive for millions of years doesn't mean that a dinosaur didn't have it. They are animals, after all. So animals have fat, and they have it all over the place. And some places they have really big fat reserve. Um, which changes their shape fairly drastically. To underscore this point, Conway asked me to consider a thought experiment. If we reconstructed modern animals like we reconstruct dinosaurs, what would they look like? In other words, if some alien paleontologist from millions of years in the future was to try and draw a modern animal, like, say, a whale or a camel, just from their fossilized skeleton, how would it look? Well, if you actually do it, the modern animals look ridiculous. If you draw a bowhead whale, for example, just from the skeleton, without a lot of fat or blubber, it looks kind of like a giant tadpole with a bulbous head and a long, snake-like tail. I mean, you take away all that stuff and you're not left with much whale. Because whales, their shape is defined by fat. Dinosaurs also had fat, and John argues that it would have changed their shape pretty dramatically. Who knows, some might have even had humps, like camels. Yeah, you could take one of the most familiar dinosaurs. That dinosaur could have camel humps, and we wouldn't know, right? Because you can't tell from a camel's back that it has humps. You just can't. There's not really anything there. Brontosaurus could have had humps. We don't know. Now, scientists do sometimes find dinosaur fossils with the soft tissues intact. And when they do, they can completely change our image of the animal. The dinosaur Cetacosaurus, for example, used to be depicted in a standard shrink-wrapped kind of way until paleontologists found this amazing full-body fossil where lots of the fat and the skin and the different soft tissues had been perfectly preserved. Turns out, the fleshy outline around the body was quite extensive. It was quite a chubby creature. There's striping all over the place, all over the body. And growing off the top of the tail, it's got like a hundred long curving quills that look kind of like floppy porcupine quills. And like you add all that together, that's, that's a creature that's we, we just would not predict that based on just finding bones alone. In recent years, fossils have been found with fat and frills and thick coats of feathers, way more than anyone had predicted. So it turns out every time we discover something like this, it's weird. And that got me thinking, so if all the ones we've discovered so far have turned out to be pretty weird, what does that tell us about the rest of them? There are bizarre possibilities out there that no one's looking at. And I thought, well, I'm going to start drawing some of these things. So John began to try something new with his art. He started to speculate. He started drawing pudgy dinosaurs and dinosaurs with humps and quills and weird skin flaps. And that was my rule. It was, how far can we go? What's the most outrageous thing I can do that we, know, we don't know isn't true, right? It's still within the realms of possibility. It's not falsified. John wasn't just making stuff up out of thin air. It was like there was a standard conservative dinosaur at the center of his drawings, and then Conway would cover it with more speculative elements. He wasn't claiming that every drawing he did was perfectly accurate, but he wanted to show people that dinosaurs as a group probably had a lot more weird variety than we think. And so to get the overall picture of dinosaurs right, I think you need a healthy dose of speculation in there Conway says that dinosaur art should always reflect the latest science, what we know for sure. But we'll never know everything. And I think the speculation is about what extra bits of weird beauty were in the world back then that we'll just never know about. 
the role of the artist is to bring back some of that real magic of the prehistoric world that was certainly there. John eventually decided to give the world some of that magic in the form of a book. He teamed up with Darren Nash and another paleo artist named Memo Kozman and published a slim little paperback called All Yesterdays. All Yesterdays is filled with dinosaurs that look very different from what you're used to. There's a triceratops that's covered in spines, a majungasaurus with skin that camouflages it against the forest floor, and a therizinosaurus that is so covered in feathers it looks like a haystack. And next to each image, the artist describes why they drew it that way. The camouflage dinosaur is drawn that way because the artist reasoned that its oddly proportioned body might have made it vulnerable to predators and in need of some kind of defense strategy. All Yesterday's was a big hit, and it helped spark a little movement for more speculative paleo art. We talk about the All Yesterday's movement as like it's the new frontier of the way we should depict prehistoric animals. Darren Nash says it's more acceptable now to draw a dinosaur based on a hypothesis. For example, horned dinosaurs like Triceratops have these absurdly large nostrils that have confused paleontologists for years. There have been a few different hypotheses put forward by scientists, and one of them is that the dinosaurs may have had inflatable nose balloons. Kind of like elephant seal or hooded seal inflatable pouches, but just would have looked weird and grotesque and utterly alien to us. But that's a very real possibility. Now, 20 years ago, if someone were to draw a triceratops with nose balloons, they would have been laughed at. But I would say that what we call the all yesterday's movement means that it is now quite uh, reasonable for an artist to say, I've shown my triceratops with giant inflatable nose balloons for this reason. And you could say, no, don't do it, that's too speculative. But it would be equally justifiable to say, okay, for the time being, that's okay. That doesn't mean Triceratops definitely had nose balloons. But by drawing it that way, it's like the artist is asking us to keep an open mind. Because even though we know a lot about the prehistoric world, and more and more every day, the science is always changing. The past is always a moving target. Paleo art is not just about drawing dinosaurs with stripes and nose balloons. Illustrators also depict dinosaur behavior, which may have even a greater impact on how we imagine extinct animals. More on that after this. Hello, this is Emmett. I'm back with Roman in the studio to talk a little bit more about paleo art. Hi, Roman. Hi. Um, in this piece, we focused a lot on on dinosaur appearance, like the look of their physical bodies. Right. But there's there's like another pretty important issue with this, which is is dinosaur behavior. Like if you're going to draw a dinosaur, you're you're going to draw it. it doing something. Doing something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so like when you think of of like dinosaur art, what are the dinosaurs usually doing? Uh, usually the T-Rex is tearing something apart. Usually the, at least when I was a kid, the brontosaurus, as we mentioned, was standing in a swamp with leaves sort of <laughs> hanging out of its mouth. Right. Like if, it, if it's like a meeting dinosaur, it's probably eating another dinosaur or attacking another dinosaur. If it's a plant eating dinosaur, it's probably being attacked or like running right. away in some kind of way. Or eating a plant. I mean, it sort of yeah. seems to be like whatever you eight as a dinosaur <laughs> is what you should be depicted doing right. at any moment of, of right. it's being depicted in, in form of art. Which like, you know, I mean, in some ways it's it's not just the dinosaur thing. Like if you think about um, nature documentaries, yeah. we like to depict action. Totally. Like when was the last time you saw a cheetah doing anything other than running down a gazelle <laughs> and like biting its throat? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but like cheetahs do a lot of other things. Sure. They have a complex life. <laughs> a whole life. And and that's like a real a real point though with with art for for people like Darren and John who who are in our our piece is like they think the lives of a lot of animals including dinosaurs are a lot less action packed than <laughs> it, it feels like when you are just looking at the art. They're not opening their mouths and roaring at the camera all the time. They're not just killing and fighting. They're doing things that living animals do they're like you know moving around and sleeping and and finding food and being boring a lot of the time (laughs) (laughs) and and you mentioned this earlier but like i feel like 
of all the dinosaurs that we don't associate with that kind of like boring activity, like Tyrannosaurus Rex totally. ranks like pretty high. Yeah. Like of yeah. all the ones we associate with like action and violence. Yeah. It's T-Rex. Absolutely. It's always chomping at something. That's its role. Even in the end of Jurassic Park, its role is to end the movie by chomping a dinosaur in half. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so when Darren and John were writing the book all yesterdays, they obviously wanted to put a Tyrannosaurus in there. And John based his T-Rex painting on this one skeleton, this kind of famous skeleton that scientists have nicknamed Stan. Stan is quite an aggressive looking Tyrannosaurus in a way. It's got quite a large, long, scary looking head. And so Stan is traditionally depicted doing very nasty things to other animals. But John is is also like pretty adamant, like that's not the whole truth of, of like who this creature was. They're probably going to kill something once every two weeks. You know, they spent the vast majority of their life asleep, probably, with a great big full belly just sleeping on the ground. And so that's how I painted it. So do you have that picture in the book? Yeah, yeah. So here's the book. <laughs> Oh, he looks so peaceful. Yeah, it's almost like a cute image. It's very cute. Yeah, just it's like slightly curled up with its little tiny T-Rex arms up by its chin. This is like one of John's like favorite pieces from All Yesterdays, and and he, and he calls it a uh, sleepy Stan. Well, in in fact, I mean, this picture it doesn't even show his teeth while it's sleeping. Yeah, which I don't think I've ever seen a T-Rex picture without it burying its teeth. Right. Which is uh, stunning to think about that I've never, and I, but now I, as I see it, I know it's true. I've never seen one without its teeth being being uh, being shown and how long they are and probably ripping into flesh. But yeah, we just, we don't show Tyrannosaurus just relaxing. And that's what they did most of the time. Right. It's probably pretty good life. Sleepy Stan. <laughs> Sleepy Stan. <laughs> Curled up. That's awesome. So if you flip Roman to like the back of the book, there's one more thing okay. that I want to show you. So the, this back section of the book is actually called All Todays. <laughs> and and the idea behind this part of the book is is it's sort of the actualization of that thought experiment that John Conway asked us to do. Right. Where, you know, you're imagining a, an alien paleontologist from the future who is trying to piece together what the contemporary world, the animals of the contemporary world look like right. based on fossil evidence. Right. So this this picture I'm looking at now is a is a manatee, but it's a land, a grazing land herbivore. Right. Read uh, the, Can you read the de- the description they have there? It says a solitary manatee is shown grazing in its mountain home. We only know the skull of this enigmatic herbivore. <laughs> so basically, like in this case, they're saying like, so with this animal, maybe we only the Found only the thing skull. we ever got was the skull. Yeah. And so like from that, you're trying to make you're like, oh, this looks a little bit like a cow skull. And it's totally common in dinosaurs that they only find one little section. It's very rare that we find full skeletons to tell you everything about them. But right. you would totally you could pick up a manatee skull and sure enough, you would think that's a. That's a cow. <laughs> and even if you do find a full skeleton, there there are other things that you could still miss. Totally. Um, oh, and this elephant has, you wouldn't have a trunk to, as evidence. So this elephant is just this snub nosed, weird looking thing. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's so true. Right. So, like a camel, the same way that we don't necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily know that a camel had had humps. You wouldn't know that an elephant had trunk, had a trunk, which is like such an iconic, oh, weird like, piece of, of anatomy in the world. It's the thing that you define an elephant by, but it's not, it's not, it's not there. And therefore, it doesn't look at all like an elephant and it just looks absurd. I, I mean, I really like it. It really sells it, especially with these. These speculative imaginings of modern animals really sells the idea of it a lot. Right. And they, yeah. they, they go, I like, I like their text on some of these. So like, if you read the swans, it like, yeah, so two swans are seen with their long scythe like forelimbs, which they must have used to spear small prey items. One of them has just caught a tadpole, one of the mysterious fish of the past. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so perfect. Right. So they really, they really embody this, like this, like, uh, you know, this, this futuristic scientist who's trying to sort of piece together the world that we currently live in now. Yeah. Um, a- a- and is making these kind of conceptual leaps from evidence to, you know, painting a real picture of what the world actually looked like. Yeah. But there's still, everyone's doing their best. It's not like making fun of them. You no, know, it really right. is. It just has to, with the limited information we have, this is what we create. And right. It, it really shows the limits of that information. Oh, it's so cool. It's yeah. such a good, it's such a good idea to think this way. It dislodges the iconography from your mind to be free. 
exactly. you know, to think about him in lots of ways. And that's that's really, and it really sells it when you see uh, a modern animal depicted in the sort of traditional right. um, dinosaur way. That I, I kind of I love that aspect of it. Invisible was produced this week by Emmett Fitzgerald in 2018. Mixed by Sharif Youssef. Music by Sean Rial. Delaney Hall is the senior producer. Kurt Colstead is the digital director. The rest of the current team is Christopher Johnson, Vivian Lay, Joe Rosenberg, Lasha Madon, Katie Mingle, Sophia Klatsker, and me, Roman Mars. We were founded as a project of 91.7 KALW in San Francisco and produced on Radio Row, which is scattered across the continent right now, but is centered in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. We are a founding member of Radiotopia from PRX. Listen and support all the podcasts in our tribe at radiotopia.fm. You can tweet at me at Roman Mars and the show at 99pi.org. We're on Instagram and Reddit too. We have cool pictures of dinosaurs and really goofy pictures of dinosaurs at 99pi.org. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.